Welcome everyone to the Liverpool.com podcast. I'm your host David Comerford and I'm joined as usual by the Liverpool.com editor Matt Addison and in today's episode we'll be discussing the sporting director landscape at Liverpool and the reason we're doing this is because there's been some reports from Germany about interest in a potential new candidate for the role at Anfield and also an update from The Athletic on what's going on on the Liverpool side of things and we'll get into those as we go on but just to start off with Matt I want to talk about the sporting director situation more generally, we know that York Schmacker is currently serving a one-year deal at Liverpool following Julian Ward's unexpected exit at the end of last season. Do you think that it's fair to say if this situation was happening at another club, maybe Man United or something like that, we look at it and say it's actually a bit you know, of a marker of dysfunction really because Liverpool in the past have always felt like they were set up for the long term with the structure that they had. Now it feels a little bit more like kind of just a stopgap really. Yeah, I think that would probably be fair. I think you've got a lot more credit in the bank with Liverpool. I think there's a bit more of a structure behind the scenes. We know that the way that they've set up their transfer committee, for want of a better word, mm-hmm. and, and the way that they, they kind of use the, the, the system and, and the people that they've got there. I know there's been a lot of change, but they've got that kind of structure that people work within, um, which I think is certainly at Manchester United, maybe not quite as clear, certainly at, at other clubs as well. I mean... Chelsea have, have got two sporting directors, haven't they? I think mm. they've they've got two people at the top and then other people that work. So they've kind of got a way of doing it, but nobody has got the same track record as Liverpool in, in terms of, of this way. They've led the way with the data and the analytics. They've had the, the, the people at the, the very top of, of that driving them forward. So it's different people, but the, the structure is the same. The, the way that they intend to go about things is, is broadly similar to what it was before. So it's... It would maybe be at another club, but that would be, I think, a slightly different case to, to how it is mm. at Liverpool. Um, yeah. And I think, to be fair, what they've done in the summer transfer market, they've identified players that have really improved Liverpool. I think they probably could have done one or two more bits. I would have liked to have seen a centre-back. We know that mm. there's maybe one or two bits that they didn't quite you know, go about in maybe the usual way that they would have done. You think of, of Moises Caicedo, I, I wouldn't imagine that that would have happened. Know, two or three years ago that mm. they would have, have gone down that path but I think broadly speaking it's um, it, it's probably one of those where yes if Manchester United were in this situation you'd probably have a bit more reason if you were a Manchester United fan to be concerned mm. I think with Liverpool it's, it's maybe slightly different they've got as I say a bit more credit in the bank if, if nothing else yeah, and I suppose to a degree it depends on sort of how much this current version of Liverpool is a continuation of the old version and how yeah. much it's like a new sort of structure, a new setup entirely. And you you allude to the last transfer window and look ahead to the next one, we, and we will get into to both of those as as we go through the episode, really. But um, obviously, Klopp's used this phrase Liverpool 2.0, largely referring to the playing squad. You know, he's very happy. The squad's a lot younger now. The squad's been regenerated, and there are you know some you know key pieces in there behind the scenes, you know, FSG have just got, for example, a lot of investment in and now that feels a little bit more stable than it did before. But are we looking at the sporting director now, with Schmacker only being on that short term contract and saying that's actually the missing piece. That's the one thing maybe, you know, obviously those positions on the pitch, but broadly speaking, that is the one thing that still needs to be kind of addressed before Liverpool can really sort of say, Yeah, we're we're now set for the next five, ten years. Yeah, I think it's it's fairly obvious what they need to do in the transfer market. Mm. It's fairly obvious that they need to get the Anfield Road end finished. You know, there's certain projects that are going on within this new version and, and the new phase for Liverpool, which kind of take care of themselves in terms of of knowing which direction they're going to go in. But obviously, the sporting director is one where I guess they've probably just not seen the right candidate so far. Mm. The, the right person hasn't been available, or you know, hasn't wanted to take the job at that time. Obviously, they had the right candidate, Michael Edwards, and, and Julian Ward was the natural successor. But mm. the, the kind of longer term plan, I think, will just take a little bit more time to, to find that right person. There's, there's been loads of uh, links, of course, but obviously the fact that Liverpool haven't done anything more long term. They've brought mm. in Jörg Schmacker, who I don't think many of us knew much about when he came in. I think the age that he is, the fact that he essentially retired six months before he came to mm. Liverpool suggests that it's probably you know, a relatively short-term thing. But you know, a short-term thing could be one or two years. It doesn't have mm. to be one transfer window, as was kind of alluded to by, by some people at one stage. So I think the, the plan is, is still coming together. It depends on exactly what they want, which is what we're going to get into mm. in terms of, of who that might be and, and when that might be. But... Um, yeah, look, it's it's a bit similar, I think, in terms of, you know, you look at the holding midfield situation and they've gone with a bit of a stopgap in Endo or McAllister because the right person wasn't available and they want to get it spot on. And yeah. 
they could have got you know Chiumeni or, or Caicedo for the next 10 years it, it's almost a bit similar mm. with a sporting director where mm. you've got Schmacker for the time being he's doing a decent enough job things are stable enough mm. the rest of the club seems to be functioning there's no major panic in terms of, of that stopgap but when the right thing comes along Liverpool will be there ready to pounce and, and get the, the right thing for, for the next 10 years because the, the last thing you want to do is pick the wrong person now yeah. and then miss out on the right person when it, it becomes available so yeah, there's there's lots of elements to it, um, similar to, to the manager situation. We always talk about who who might succeed Jurgen Klopp. A lot of it's going to come down to timing and, and who's available when and and all of that sort of thing. So yeah, it's it's one of those things that I think will will be high on the agenda to get sorted, and I'm sure we'll get you know a little bit of movement at some point in the next few months. Yeah. We took the words right out of my mouth there about um, Endo and, and Schmacker effectively being the sort of same pr- principle yeah. really in terms of the recruitment of both of those individuals. And just as you were talking, it was interesting about, you know, the lines you were saying with like, they want to make sure they get the right person, they're willing to wait. It sounds a lot, almost like the approach for, for transfers, yeah. where it's like, wait for the perfect one, as opposed to just, you know, getting someone through the door. And obviously for the most part, that probably has worked. Um, and they just do just need that, that stock up, which they have at the moment. But we've seen a lot of, you know, organisational change at Liverpool. Michael Edwards left, Julian Ward left soon after that was obviously a shock. You know, Ian Graham, who I think was the head of, head of research as well, a very influential figure within quite a short space of time. I mean, if from the fans' perspective, while kind of, you know, they all very reasonably said, you know, we've been doing this job for a long time, you know, it's obviously taken a lot out of them. They just need a little bit of a break from that regard. Um, from a fan's perspective, it's easy to see that level of upheaval and be a little bit concerned. Would, would you say that that's now, those concerns have been abated a little bit by what we've seen or is it still a little bit kind of up in the air? Yeah, I mean, it's still early days, isn't it? We, we don't know exactly how Julian Ward would have been different to Michael Edwards because he wasn't quite there long enough. That might have been a bit more of a change. Everyone kind of assumes that you know they worked together and they were in the same system, so it would have just been Michael Edwards' number two type mm-hmm. thing, and he kind of comes into that role and, and does it the same way. But maybe there would have been you know certain differences. Obviously, we saw a little bit of a pattern in terms of the Portuguese market, and maybe that would have been something mm-hmm. that they looked at a little bit more. Obviously, Michael Edwards was you know very much linked to, to the Red Bull group and, and that sort of thing. So there are there are um, you know differences between those two. But yeah, it's it, it's one of those really where I think it's probably a little bit too soon to to know for sure in terms of. Um, what Liverpool want and, and the direction of, of travel but you know of course when there's that much upheaval it was the same with the midfield in the summer yeah. I'm sure a lot of people were quite apprehensive about losing so many players and bringing in so many at the same mm. time but you know as we've seen it doesn't have to be you know a, a bad thing it can be you know the, these people have been there for a long time they weren't necessarily you know wanting to, to continue it. it might be a good thing to just refresh and, and do yeah. things and again similar to the transfers you'd rather that was over a period of three or four years rather than three or four months but hmm. it is what it is and yeah Liverpool will, will have to come up with a plan accordingly. Yeah it, it seems like there's actually plenty of metaphors for the, the squad and the, um, the structure behind the scenes really in terms of the similarities there but it's interesting that you mentioned Portugal with Julian Ward obviously he had kind of an extensive experience there he'd obviously built up a network of contacts and like you say that did look like it was going to be the big theme what it actually ended up being it is kind of the Bundesliga has taken precedence yeah. obviously Three of the four players Liverpool signed in the summer in Sobberside, Graven, Birch and Endo, all came from the Bundesliga. And, and to a degree, that, that might be a coincidence. But obviously, we know Klopp has taken on a bigger role. Schmacker is um, obviously someone who's got extensive experience there as well. So it's not exactly a surprise. So if we reflect on, on the window that Schmacker had, then we don't know from the outside kind of exactly how big a role he was playing. We don't think he was kind of influential maybe in picking targets, for example. But the Athletic have reported that he negotiated deals for Sobersly, Gravenberch and Endo. In the case of Sobersly, he had a release clause, so I don't think we can, you know, it's just too much merit in talking about that. It was simply a case in the end of, you know, we're going to pay you the money, how are we going to structure it type thing. Um, but in the other two cases, you know, Gravenberch, I think, cost roughly €40 million, Euros, Endo was about £15, £16 million. Pounds. I mean, would you say that Schmacker can be sort of proud of, of how those deals turned out in terms of the value for money that he extracted? I think so. Um, obviously McAllister was mainly uh, Julian Ward before he yeah. moved on so that's kind of the, the one that was attributed to him but yeah the other three being those types of players I think to some degree I think you can give him a bit of credit with Sobosly because not everybody would have been happy to pay that release clause mm. you know as much as he didn't have to do negotiations yeah. he did have to kind of be aware that that was a player that was mm-hmm. worth sixty million pounds, which is, you know, what is it the, the 
third up or whatever highest Liverpool transfer midfield transfer or, record. Yeah, yeah, midfield transfer record certainly. You know, Liverpool have have picked out a player which has cost a fair bit of money mm. and. You know, it, it wasn't a secret that he was a really good footballer, but there's a reason that only really Newcastle challenged them for yeah. for Sobos line. Not you know, mm. not all of Europe was was queuing up for him, and yet Liverpool put down a, a fairly substantial amount of money for him. So I think he deserves a bit of credit to, to some degree in in terms of, of that. Mm. Obviously, the other two are, are kind of longer term targets. Gravenberg is someone that Liverpool have looked at for two or three years at least, maybe a little bit longer. Yeah. Certainly, when he was at Ajax, um, I'm pretty sure they would have gone for him when he went to Bayern if that deal hadn't pretty much been been wrapped up for him to go there. So, I think again with that, it's it's kind of a bit on him and a bit on the club in terms of, of a long term plan. And Endo is, is is a tricky one to know. But I imagine he probably had a bigger influence on that than mm. than most. Obviously, Jurgen Klopp was aware of him, but I'm sure um, you know Schmacker might have, have maybe known a little bit more about him in terms of, of recent times, the last couple of years. That that probably would make sense. So, I think it, it was a decent job. I'm sure you know the, the counter to all of that is that they didn't get the Caicedo deal. Mm. Again, I think there's there's maybe mitigating circumstances around that in that you know Chelsea had, had been so far down the line with it. You know, people have, have talked about Declan Rice, but again, that was similar that. He was basically going to Arsenal from from January onwards. We knew that, and it would have been tricky for, for Liverpool to get involved. Obviously, the the sort of order of the transfers and the way that things moved mm. didn't make make that make sense anyway. So, yeah, look, I I don't think you can criticise him too much for the way that the Caicedo thing happened. I think you can give him a fair bit of credit for the bits that did happen. Yeah. Um, Liverpool still need to do more, but it was probably the most difficult summer transfer window that Liverpool have had under under Jurgen Klopp really in terms of. You know, the, the first one is obviously difficult, but you can kind of improve fairly easily because you don't have to get absolutely elite players. You can kind of bring in, yeah. you know, a bit more of a, a development project. And, you know, the, the, the more later ones have been more tricky in terms of having to find the very elite players. But this time it was a case of a whole new midfield, potentially looking in other areas as well. There was you know, loads of things that popped up, as we know, with, you know, Henderson and Fabinho that we didn't expect to happen. So mm. I think... All of those things considered, it was a pretty decent job that he's done. Liverpool have got some really, really good footballers. The midfield rebuild seems to have worked fairly well. There's still a little bit more to do, but I don't think you can be, I don't think you can be too critical in terms of the scale of job that he did compared mm. to, you know, what what previously might have, have been a much easier summer for him to, to sort of navigate and, and get through. Yeah, I mean, it has been largely at Liverpool evolution, hasn't it? <laughs> sort of down the years and. There was all we always knew there was going to be a, a rebuild in the summer, but I think even Liverpool were surprised by the pace that it, it happened. That yeah. you know, obviously they were in control of that situation, but I think for them it was when those Fabinho and Henderson offers came in, they felt like they couldn't turn them down, and then that the task and, and the outlook was just completely different. I mean, I think there's a strong chance that Fabinho and Henderson would still have been Liverpool players really without kind of the rise of Saudi Arabia. They, they might have played a significant amount of football already this season. Um, and they wanted it to be kind of that gradual handover, I think, whereas it's turned out to be kind of in the space of a few months, you've completely revamped your midfield. Um, on Caicedo, I, as you were talking there, I, I remember the line in the summer that Billy Hogan, the, the CEO, was actually the one taking the lead on those negotiations. So I suppose, you know, you, you can't even really bring Schmacker into that conversation in terms of a, a critical lens because he was kind of maybe a little bit curiously sidelined but at the same time when it's kind of a 110 million deal you can kind of understand why they'd want to sort of have maybe the, the actual boss of the club really yeah, I, mean, I, I, I don't know to be honest how unusual that is I know mm. that that was a line that, that came out during the summer but that that might just be the case normally yeah. with those big deals or, or with any deals potentially it might be the sporting director's job to a certain point and then somebody else comes in to you know, do the numbers and, and, and do that side of things I don't know specifically how that works but yeah, um, but yeah you, you're right to, to bring that up it, mm. it was a it was an unusual situation that I think probably Liverpool went into knowing that he was probably going to Chelsea anyway but yeah. they had a go it didn't work you move on and, and you don't really lose anything well if you're if you're FSG and I'm just purely speculating here um and you say there's a deal for Endo and it's 15 million. You know you probably get notified about that, and you're like, yeah, go on, let's do that. You know that that's only that's not much of our budget really for the window. But then when it's 110 million, yeah. you probably want to be much more kind of involved in that. And maybe Hogan was kind of like their sort of um, intermediary or, or their middleman in in that case. Like it's not sort of difficult to understand why someone with a bit more authority might negotiate a deal of that magnitude. I suppose is what I'm getting at. Um, and on Romeo Lavia as well, the other one that you mentioned, I think. 
the way it played out frustrated a lot of Liverpool fans in terms of you know these bids going in every sort of week it felt like and then they were rejected and Southampton were just consistently like no we're asking for this amount of money um, and I think also the fact that it was all leaking out was again a bit of a frustration because we'd been so used to things happening quite efficiently behind the scenes again you can't blame Schmacker for that you don't know where that information was coming from and also the Athletic reported that he was essentially just given a limited budget I'm not sure what Liverpool's final offer was off the top of my head I think it was something along the lines of like 41 rising to 45 something like that I think it might have been a little bit more after mm. after the Caicedo thing but by oh, that yeah. point it was it was obviously you know a little bit too far down the line but again with that like it's it, it's an unprecedented situation mm. Liverpool tried something they had their valuation and didn't want to go over it and look he's, he's been injured he's not played for Chelsea we can't really judge you know how good a player is he going to be for them but I think that they are probably right in terms of the principle of yeah know, to, to be paying 58 million I think wasn't it that, that yeah, Chelsea yeah. went to I mean that, that's a lot of money for a player that's mm. played you know effectively half a Premier League season for a team that wasn't very good mm. and Manchester City had sold him a year before for about 12 million so yeah again you know people will will look at that but Liverpool did the important thing I think which was to get Endo and I know we, we spoke at length about my kind of reservations about his limitations mm. but I think in the past Liverpool would have gone right it's it's this guy or no one this time it was it's this guy yeah we didn't get him we'll we'll get somebody as a, a bit of a stopgap in, in in between in the middle rather than than not do anything so I think that was a bit of a change of, of approach which kind of worked out and, and was for the best but the the Lavia one is is tricky. Maybe maybe in five years we'll look back and think, oh, what if yeah. what if Liverpool had got him? But for the money, I think it was probably too much of a risk to be able to say that. There's there's an equal chance I think that Chelsea have massively overspent, just like yeah. they have on on loads of other players. Well, I I think as well the line that Liverpool kind of maintained in this was well actually Bicet he's only played about um, seventeen more games than Bicetic. And Bicetti's actually got injured midway through March last year and the season yeah. was over. So the gap would have been very small, really, if he'd managed to play until the end of the season. And then you're starting to think, well, we already have him and he's kind of our reference point in all of this. And I think that as much as, you know, Lavia would, it would probably have been a preferable solution, even as kind of the start of number six at this stage of his career, I, I don't think Liverpool's stance is kind of like particularly baffling. Like you like you say, Matt, you can kind of see where they were coming from with it. And, and again, you know, Lavia... There was a report from the Mail yesterday that he's not going to be playing until December, so it's going to be a while before we can kind of get like a full verdict and a full reading on that, whether he even gets in the team at Chelsea, obviously with Caicedo and Fernandes already in that midfield. All of that remains to be seen, but again, I think the main point here is that from Schmacker's standpoint, I don't think he can really be blamed for either of those sort of transfer failures, even if there are maybe minute details that, that others would have done differently. So if we look ahead to the future now... Um, Rather than getting into names, um, because we could be here all day if we do that debate and the, the merits of various individuals, what kind of sporting model do you want to see Liverpool settle on going forward? Because I think a lot of fans would be like, you know what, if we did, if we copy and pasted exactly what we had with Michael Edwards and Julian Ward, then we're not going to go far wrong. You, you kind of alluded to it earlier, Matt. Liverpool was sort of the envy of, of their rivals when they had that model in place. Or, on the other hand, is there kind of an argument that had the games evolved a little bit or, or Liverpool have changed a little bit where they need a slightly different model or should they literally just be looking to replicate what they already had? For me, I think you replicate what you had. Mm. Um, I I was a little bit unsure about that stance maybe at the start of the summer where you're thinking, you know, Chelsea have, have got all of this money, there's Newcastle now to compete with, there's, there's a lot more teams who are capable of spending way more than Liverpool. We don't quite know what Manchester United are going to look like if you know, their kind of partial takeover happens and maybe there's a few changes there, maybe they become a little bit smarter. Mm. Um, you know, the, there's, loads of, uh, there's loads more competition now than when Michael Edwards was at Liverpool. Um, it, it's a lot, a lot trickier to be able to compete with these players. I think the fact that we saw Liverpool make a British record transfer bid for Moises Caicedo probably suggests that they've kind of seen that as well. Mm. Um, but I think we, we shouldn't get confused between what Michael Edwards did when he was at Liverpool and obviously Julian Ward as well was a part of that. Wasn't they've got to go and get cheap players and make them really good. It was about finding the value. It was about finding underappreciated assets. Mm. I don't think you know that really should be something that Liverpool would, would ever think about moving away from. Um, of course, if you can get a player that you think is, is undervalued, you can develop them. You know, why wouldn't you do that? 
Um, and let's not forget as well, they, they did spend you know big money. They, they bought Naby Keita for you know fifty-two million pounds, which was a lot more you know relatively back then than, than yeah. what it would be now. Um, you know that they have put big money down on on different players. They've obviously been prepared to, to go big on you know Van Dijk and Allison being the mm. obvious ones, but you know they, they've spent a, a fair bit of money as well. It, it wasn't always a case of they found a, a Mohamed Salah for thirty-six million and, and mm. then he became what he became. Obviously that that you know is no bad thing, um, yeah. but I think broadly that's that's what Liverpool that's what Liverpool looked to me to be aiming for in terms of you know the positions that they filled. The people who've left, you mentioned Ian Graham before. They've kind of got somebody in a similar position, Will Spearman has yeah. took that on. It's not like they're they're moving away from what they were doing before, they've not changed trajectory basically. Mm. It's it's still it, it's still trying to compete in an environment where your competitors have still got loads more money than you have and mm. so you've got to do things more cleverly. But, you know, that's that's kind of the way that I would want my football club to run anyway. Um, yeah. I don't I don't particularly have any aspirations of Liverpool becoming Chelsea or mm. being you know, taken over by Qatar. I, I want Liverpool to be the cleverest. I want Liverpool to be leading the way with the, the data and the analytics as they have been. You know, and o- other teams will catch up. Newcastle look like they're doing things with both fronts. They've got the yeah. data and, and they're doing sensible things, but they're spending loads of money as well. Liverpool are going to have to be clever and, and push on and, and try and find new things. But I think that's that's kind of the way that they will do things. That's the way they've done things up to now. So for me, it's a case of why change it? I don't think it's. Yeah. I know you mentioned kind of going back to that, but I don't think they've ever really gone away from that. Yeah. It's kind of just, you know, there's, there's maybe been a couple of, of poor decisions. The summer of, of 2022, I think, will will long be one where mm. you think, what if they'd have just got a yeah. midfielder? Because that's that's all it would have took, isn't it? It wouldn't have nece- necessarily been that they would have gone on and, and won the league or whatever, but at least they would have been in the Champions League yeah. this season. So I think that we'll we'll go back to 2022 quite frequently in terms of, of a mistake. Yeah. But I don't think that that, that wasn't a, a strategic thing that was massively away from what they'd done before because yeah. they'd waited a year for Naby Keita. They'd waited six months or whatever it was for, for Van Dijk. You know, they, they have, they've taken those risks before. It's just on this occasion, the risk kind of backfired for the first time. Yeah, and I think... You know, Liverpool often shop in kind of that mid-tier price range and people sort of often made the point that, you know, imagine what Michael Edwards could do if he had um, kind of the, the same amount of, you know, budget that, you know, the likes of Man City, Chelsea, Man United were spending and I suppose there was a little insight into that with, with the Caicedo deal, which was very unlike, like you say, Matt, something Liverpool would ordinarily have done. So maybe there is, you know, there are signs that they are adapting to a degree as well. I mean, we know that they were actually, you know, strongly considering Jude Bellingham and, in a strange year, maybe if they had signed a midfielder last year and sort of their need wasn't as excessive, maybe Drew Bellingham, yeah. you know, who's to say he could have been a Liverpool player this year, obviously there would have been a big battle with Real Madrid there. I think that the way it has changed as well is that you've got to remember when Michael Edwards was at Liverpool, they weren't really a complete team where they, 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 they had to go out and spend money in terms of improving the team to get to a certain level. Yeah. Whereas now, maybe you can say, well, rather than it's almost I know it's the reverse with Bellingham because the decision was literally let's get three or four instead of one but I think there is a bit more of an opportunity maybe from next summer to go actually we can go and spend 100 million on one player and that's mm-hmm. it that's us done for the summer that's what they would have done in 2022 if Chumaney yeah. hadn't been wanted by Real Madrid for example mm-hmm. that would have been what they would have done they wouldn't have signed loads of other players as well it would have just been that one you plug them into the team and, and you go so it, it's it's a little bit of a different job. I think you can kind of apply the same principles, but at the same time, it's it's not a case of basically when Klopp came in, they had to improve the entire team because none of them were at the level that they're at now. Now it's not even just that the team is at a certain level. It's you know you look at the depth that they've got, yeah. the squad that they've got, the young players coming through. It's a lot harder now to to make that next step and and get back up to that mm. level. So it's a different job, but I think you can apply the same principles in terms of you know why not go and get Diaz and, and Gakpo, for example. You don't have to spend £100 million. You can, you can be a little bit more sensible and, and still get those elite level. Yeah, I think the, the point that you made there is quite a good one because if you look at the top deals under Michael Edwards, Alisson was a solution because the goalkeeper position had been a problem for a long time. Similar at centre-back, really. Van yeah. Dijk was the one they needed to kind of build around there to have that feeling of stability. 
Whereas now you're looking at kind of the top players, and it's like they've actually been there and won the league, won the Premier League. Sorry, won the Premier League, won the Champions League. So it's like, how can they kind of become a team who can do that multiple times now? Really, so it's sort of like building success versus sustaining it. Really, I think it's kind of the the way Liverpool have evolved. You know, in large part to what Michael Edwards has done. Really, you know, it's a credit to him. But there's a couple of kind of like sporting models I want to touch on, and I want to get into kind of Klopp's role as well um, before we finish up. So. Let's begin by sort of briefly looking at kind of the multi-club aspect. We know Man City have done that. I think Chelsea have basically, Chelsea's owners have basically just bought Strasbourg outright. Yeah. Um, it's a big thing at the moment, basically. Clubs trying to you know, build these networks where they can develop players. Do you see that as a route Liverpool go down? Because it would feel maybe a little bit kind of at odds with what we've seen FSG do in the past in terms of their quite sort of maybe um, conservative strategy, if you like. Is there any scope in your eyes for Liverpool sort of building that network or do you think that'll be something that kind of happens sort of on the side and they're kind of stepping out of that? I have to say, I don't massively like this model. Mm. Um, I don't like the idea that Red Bull own loads of football clubs and pretend that they don't and all that nonsense. Mm. I don't like the fact that Strasbourg is is owned by Chelsea, um, that Manchester City have got clubs all over the world. But it is... It's an advantage that you've kind of got to, to get on board with if, if you want to compete at, at that level. Um, whether I like it or not, FIFA or whoever it is that can dictate these things has decided that that's fine and, mm. and people can do that. And so that's kind of, you know, you either do it or you get left behind. I don't think it necessarily for Liverpool would have to be as hard as they go and buy a club in France or whatever. It, mm. it could be that you have an arrangement with a certain club for yeah. loan deals. It could be It could be that sort of thing where you, you kind of, you don't own that club, but they kind of benefit, yeah. you benefit. It, it's kind of a bit of a, a mutual agreement. So it's it's kind of a bit of a halfway house between actually just going in and, and, and buying five or six clubs around the world. You can kind of, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure Liverpool used to have agreements with a couple of clubs in, in, in various parts of Europe where they would send certain players and, and it, it would be a bit of an arrangement that every year there'd be a player that'd go there and... Yeah. You know, you knew that you could trust that environment. You knew that it was a club that played similar football, that was in, you know, maybe the top two or three in that league. So it was a similar kind of challenge to the way that, you know, if that player was to come back to Liverpool and make it, it would be similar kind of pressures in terms of, of the way that they play and, and that sort of thing. So I think there's there's definitely a way in which you can make that kind of multi-club thing happen yeah. without actually having to go out and, and buy mm. those teams. Um, I think that would definitely be something that, you know, Liverpool could could look mm. at. Um, but again, um, it, it's it's easy to say that it's a lot harder to, to do that. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I don't know anything about Strasbourg, but I suspect mm. they probably don't play that similarly to Chelsea. Yeah. I don't think the arrangement there is necessarily a footballing one. I think it's probably more a financial one. Mm. Of you can just throw a few kids like they used to do with Vitesse yeah. Arnhem, didn't they? Where they used to send them and basically just pump up the prices and then sell them on, mm. and that was their basically a way around financial fair play because you had loads of kids that you could bring in young and, and sell them for, yeah. for big money. Um, I, I think that the more kind of the way that I would want to see it work with Liverpool is more a case of, you know, where can you send Bobby Clark on loan this season where he can come back. Yeah. To be fair to Chelsea, they did it with Mason Mount, it, that, that mm. kind of similar thing of, I know he ended up obviously leaving in the end as well, but that, that kind of more footballing strategy rather than we're going to make money out of this. I think that's that's probably the uh, the way that I'd like to see it used. Yeah, I, I I think I take your point in terms of it is a little bit sort of easier said than done. But we have seen Liverpool build up relationship with clubs before. You know, they've obviously got one with Leipzig, and that's not very reciprocal. But you see things like Cavalio going there on yeah. loan. That's the kind of thing that can actually protect that relationship. Where Leipzig start to think actually no, there is actually something in this for us beyond just getting a release clause triggered every summer. Yeah. Um, and even you know. I don't think there's any sort of immediate prospect of clubs in England being part of a multi-club model or anything like that, but you see the relationships that people have with some clubs, you know, Blackburn, they sent a few players there on loan in recent years, same for Preston, and that speaks to what you're saying in terms of you can form that sort of sporting relationship, and even yeah. though there isn't kind of an ownership connection between the two parties, like, there is kind of that understanding there that it's it's mutually in their interest to take a player like a, a Leighton Clarkson or a Harvey Elliott or a Calvin Ramsey, Seth Van Der Berg, players like that can go there, really help those teams because they're so talented and then come back to Liverpool. Liverpool either sell them 
for more money than they would have been worth previously, or they can actually integrate them into the first team, which is obviously a bit, a bit, a bit of variety I between those two outcomes. I think Blackburn, to be fair, is, is a good example of why it's so difficult, because Harvey Elliott went there, they basically built the team around him, and it was you know a brilliant season for him. He fitted in, he did exactly what you would have wanted from, from him. The season after, Blackburn, same manager, still Tony Mowbray, I think it was there at the time, but they played a completely different type of football. And it just didn't suit the way that Leighton Clarkson played. Mm. He was kind of stuck in the middle and the ball was going from the centre-back, launched up to the forward. Mm. It was the same team, the same manager, only one summer apart, but they played completely different football. Mm. They did things a completely different way. Obviously, they'd lost Elliot. I think they'd lost one or two other players. Maybe that was the summer maybe that Armstrong left. I can't remember who it was, but um, basically that... But that, I think, sums up why it's so tricky, because yeah. from Liverpool's perspective, you'd look at it and think, well, this was exactly the way that we needed Harvey Elliott to develop. You'd imagine it would be broadly the same the following year for Leighton Clarkson, but actually yeah. it, was, it was completely different. So I think that's that's a, a neat little example, really, of how it can be. Mm. It can be a good thing, um, but you've got to, to get the, the conditions right. And yeah. Maybe Blackburn is 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 an extreme example. Maybe you know a, a club in in Spain or France or Portugal or whatever. Maybe wouldn't change style quite so drastically. Yeah. But it's not it's not kind of a a one size fits all. It, mm. it very much has to be the right low move or or it doesn't really work. Yeah, and I think really you've got kind of this scale where you've got sort of Harvey Elliott is on the side where it's perfect, and then the side of the other side, Leighton Clarkson, doesn't really work out for him, and then Tyler Morton's probably in the middle, plays yeah. a lot of football, yeah. does all right. But he's on loan in the in the championship again this year. You know that that's no sort of criticism of him. It's just that sometimes it's not always the launch pad that you want it to be. And um, sometimes it just ends up kind of fizzling out a little bit. One club where that probably works really well is sort of Red Bull Salzburg. Really, you know, Leipzig can send players there. They know they've got basically a very similar football and identity. They're they're so kind of interlinked, even if officially they're not. Yes. Um, and we've seen obviously multiple players sort of make that step and and do well obviously haven't made the transition up to the Bundesliga club. Liverpool have been linked with Max Abel, who was the um, briefly the sporting director at Leipzig, and the Athletic have played down that interest, and the actual reason that he left Leipzig was that he was not He was basically refusing to rule out a move to Bayern Munich. So you put two and two together, he's probably going to go to Bayern instead. Just a question of when that one happens. But I do think the link with someone from that Red Bull system is still quite interesting because... Liverpool, we know, have bought four players um, from there in the space of about five years, I think, starting with Navi Keita. So, one of the th- I tweeted about this the other day um, on the base of an article that I'd written. If you look at the deals that they did for um, Keita, Minamino, Canate and Sabasly, they paid less than €3 million Euros for those players. Liverpool then give them €179 million. So, I'm sort of sat there thinking to myself, at what point do Liverpool start to think, hang on, can we actually be the ones who are getting those players at source, yeah. developing them, and then we're basically saving tens of millions, which kind of works within the FSG model, really, where it is kind of self-sustaining. So is there scope for Liverpool to cut out of the middleman? Obviously, they need to be signing sort of established players alongside that, but it was certainly a tweet that I put out that generated quite a lot of um, differing opinions, let's say. So where do you kind of stand on that? I think it is tricky. I can mm. understand, you know, quite a few people came back and said that, you know, Liverpool's level doesn't really work like that. It's it's not quite that simple, which mm. I do understand. Um, and to be fair to Liverpool, I think they are doing that to a certain degree with some of the young players that they've brought in. It's a lot more difficult now with Brexit, but they basically fast tracked the the move for Stefan Bajetic. They were intending to do that a few months or maybe a couple of years later, but they did it quicker to get that over the line. That isn't a deal that they could do now. Um, yeah. I don't know, for example, with Dominic Sabozlai, could they have signed him when he was 18 or 19? Mm. I, I don't know. Um, I, I suspect they probably could because he probably would have been in the first team at that point for, mm. for Salzburg. Maybe they could have gone directly to, to buy him. But I suppose that it comes back to almost what we were talking about with the multi-club thing. I think for that to work for Liverpool, it'd have to be that they brought them in but then sent them out on loan. So yeah. It, it might be a little bit more tricky, for example, to convince Dominic Savoslai to leave hmm. Salzburg to come directly to Liverpool for a small fee and then go out on loan somewhere. Yeah. He's probably looking at it and thinking, well, I can go to Leipzig and if yeah. I'm good enough, you'll you'll pay for me anyway. Like hmm. if, if you reach that level, um, Liverpool are not going to say, 
well, we you turned us down when you were 19, so we're not going to buy you when you're 22. It, it doesn't really work like that. So I can kind of see both sides of it. I think there's definitely scope for Liverpool to do a little bit more of this, but maybe the Brexit regulations and the fact that they can't bring in those players. Maybe they can look, you know, South America or they can look yeah. in, in different places. But I think it's probably a little bit more tricky for Liverpool than it would be partly because the level that Liverpool are at but also yeah. just the regulations and, and the rules around it maybe make mm. it not impossible but yeah. maybe a, a little bit more tricky than what it might have been even just you know a few years ago well that's the thing that is so good about the Red Bull model is that you know you look at where those players that I mentioned were coming from and I mean I was playing second tier football in Japan Keita and Kanate were doing the same in France so I was actually playing for his dad's academy in Hungary I mean, so, so he was a real diamond in the rough that, that they found and brought to Sal Salzburg. So what kind of the model would be is somebody kind of comes in and really kind of maybe expands the scouting network, but more so than that, changing the approach in terms of sort of taking those players at source, really. And then, like you say, Matt, the big crux of it is can they then develop them to be kind of the stars or do they need other clubs to do that for them, basically? And is that why it works for Liverpool? I think an interesting example of someone who's like a bit of a halfway point with this is Brighton because we know they've got Uni and SJ Liverpool played them in the Europa League. Um, but they're kind of, just looking at it now, they, they only really send sort of one player a year um, to that club. I think Tony Bloom's got a stake there. But what they're doing is with all their other players is that they're giving them sort of really sort of clever loan moves. And the success rate isn't always there. But if you're having kind of two, maybe two or three players each season who are coming back from those loans after you've kind of you know, spotted them far afield and coming into your first team. And at Liverpool, obviously, they wouldn't need kind of the stars coming in alongside. That That to me seems like the kind of thing that, that might be worth exploring. Yeah. Um, I think you can definitely do it more, but I think it's also fair to say that Liverpool have, you know, Jarrell Kwanzaa this season. Yeah. I think Luke Chambers is the next one to, to mm. come in. I think he possibly has picked up a little bit of an injury on international duty. Hopefully that's not too bad. Otherwise, I think we maybe if, if Robertson's out for a few weeks, we might see him in the Europa League. Liverpool are doing it to, to, mm. to a certain degree. I think Kate Gordon has been really unlucky, but he looked yeah. like one that was nailed on. Um, ben Doak, obviously. Mm. Um, you know, they, they are doing it a bit, a little bit younger. You've got people they brought in, like Trent Coney Doherty, for example, yeah. who's one who's, who's going to be, you know, a good player in, in a couple of years' time. So they are doing it to a certain degree. Maybe, maybe they can do it more, and, and maybe they can do it. Maybe with a different different kind of player, you know. I think Kone Doherty was only maybe fifteen or sixteen when he came in. Maybe, maybe there is scope to do it with you know slightly older players, and, and maybe you put down mm. almost a bit like what they did with Marco Grujic, where it was about five million, where he was you know a highly rated teenager. Obviously, it didn't quite yeah. work for him, but he was he was that little bit older. They paid that little mm. bit more money for him. Maybe there's maybe there's scope to do it a little bit more. Um, yeah. But I, I can kind of see both sides of it where I think you've probably got to remember as well with Salzburg and, and Leipzig, they, they've got that pathway. Hundreds of players, have, well, maybe not hundreds, but lots of players yeah. have done it. It's probably a little bit easier to sell it to Sabos Life, for example. Mm. You can go to Salzburg, then you can go to Leipzig and then we'll, we'll let you go. We'll have a, a reasonable mm -hmm. release clause and if you get to that level, you can move. Mm. With Liverpool, it's, it's maybe a little bit trickier to see yeah. that pathway until it happens. If it happens, then obviously yeah. you can you can get on board with that. But I think, yeah, I think it's about something there really in terms of you need sort of the success stories that you can point to. It's really hard to actually get that worker model in place. I mean, once it's in there, you can sort yeah. of just have a production line really. But obviously, you've got to develop it in the first place, and that's going to be really difficult. But and again, we have we have seen that with Ben Doak. I'd be surprised if Ben Doak didn't think about Harvey Elliott, Curtis Jones, Trent Alexander yeah. Arnold. I don't think he would have come to Liverpool if those players hadn't have been given those opportunities. Mm. I think it's it's pretty clear that if you're at that level, you will get that opportunity. Yeah. Um, but it's it's a case of that that being the case for for players in this country and, and the best around the UK. Can you can you expand that? Can you go to South America and, and bring in these players? And yeah. South America is an interesting one because Real Madrid have tried it. As soon as they lost out on Neymar, they basically bought every <laughs> young Brazilian kid who might be the yeah. next one. But, you know, I don't know how much they paid for Rodrigo, but it was, you know, 40, 50 million euros, I think, when he was about 18. It's mm. it, it's not necessarily a, a fast track to cheap. It might be yeah. that you get a player cheaper, but you are still going to have to put a fair bit of money in. I think it's fair to say that, you know, Real Madrid have gambled quite a lot with the fear of missing out on the next Neymar has, has cost yeah. them a lot of money. 
obviously not as much as, as what it would have done if you know Rodrigo had gone to Leipzig, for example, and then gone to Real Madrid. It would have cost them a lot more, but mm. they have pumped in a lot of money as well alongside all uh, all of the uh, the risks that they've taken. Yeah, so I think really kind of the, the sensible line to draw with this is is what you said in terms of are they going to do that kind of deal more as opposed to kind of fundamentally maybe changing the model to bring yeah. it in line with maybe some of those other clubs who have made it work. And it'll be interesting to see who Liverpool bring in and what their plan is in terms of how they're going to develop players and whether they're going to explore markets that people haven't traditionally been involved in. I think that's something that we're going to sort of be able to observe quite quickly in terms of when they can get their feet under the table and are in their first couple of transfer windows, like how will they differ to sort of Michael Edwards uh, and co. One last thing then, Matt, just briefly before we finish up. I mean, we've not really touched on the role of Jürgen Klopp within all this. Um, the Athletic um, reported that Schmack is essentially, in fact, no, I think it was something Schmack said himself, he called himself a service provider to Klopp and an assistant, yeah. um, which is different to Michael Edwards, who was basically the player who actually went against Klopp at certain times. There's obviously the famous example of Klopp wanted Julian Brandt. Michael Edwards said, no, let's get Mohamed Salah, and obviously that one turned out, yeah. turned out quite well in the end. Um, the model is still kind of quite cooperative in terms of the data department and the scouts will kind of generate the list of targets and then Klopp's the one who chooses from it. But, like, do you think the sporting director should be someone who challenges Klopp or someone who basically does his bidding? I mean, it's difficult because he hears this, you know, he's a larger-than-life figure, he's achieved so much at Liverpool, but it doesn't necessarily feel like the healthiest way for a club to run. It seems a little bit like Wenger's, Wenger's Arsenal or Ferguson at Man United. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot more data and a lot more kind of weight in terms of that side mm. than, than maybe that would have, have been the case in the past. Um, I don't think Klopp is, is necessarily one who would want that as well, mm. uh, as much as maybe Ferguson and Wenger took over completely. Yeah. I think there is still an element of, of collaboration and, and Klopp realises that he can't do everything, he can't. He can't be the one that coaches the team, but also picks out the next Neymar from South yeah. America. Like you can't have both extremes. Mm. It's got to be a bit of a, a collaboration. But I think the um, the fundamental thing for me is we don't know exactly how long Jurgen Klopp is going to be at Liverpool. Yeah. Now, I'd be very surprised if he went before his contract. I think it's far more likely that he will will extend. But mm. um, we don't know exactly how long he is going to be at, at the club. Yeah. With his contract being until twenty twenty six, I think it's probably more likely that whoever the next sporting director is will be at the club longer than what he is. Yeah. Certainly that would be the plan in terms of you wouldn't want another Julian Ward situation where he mm. takes it for a year and, and then moves on. Yeah. Um, for, for whatever reason, um, you know, I think the plan will at least be that this will be you know, a, a five or a ten year thing, um, which obviously, if it was ten years, would, would kind of make it fairly obvious that they would be there longer than Klopp. Um, mm. So that, that kind of plays into what what you want from a sporting director. Do you want them to be the person at the top of, of the club who, who makes some of those decisions? Probably they're going to be fairly influential in terms of finding a successor for Klopp. Yeah. They're obviously going to have work to do in terms of, of Salah and Van Dijk replacements in the next few years. There's you know, contracts, there's, there's things to think about in terms of, of that. But the big one mm. is you know who is, is the man to come after Klopp. Um, so yeah, that that would be my kind of thinking really in terms of, of the the power balance. Mm. It probably makes more sense if this person is going to be there longer. Yeah, maybe they're the the person who has who has slightly more weight in these decisions. And that's one of the reasons why I think clubs like United and Arsenal have struggled. Certainly, United for longer when those figures have left because they were so kind of embedded into the centre of the organisation that when you took them out, no one really knew what yeah. they were doing and there was a bit of a, a vacuum that was left. Klopp's obviously not on the, on the same level of those, but you certainly get the sense that his power has kind of increased and you don't want that to get to a point where the balance isn't quite right. And I think to be fair to Liverpool, there is still that sort of sense of, of cooperation at yeah, the moment. Yeah, I mean, there's the famous story of if someone wanted to change a light bulb at Arsenal's training ground, they had to ask Arsene Wenger <laughs> first. So it's not that... It's not that level of, of kind of yeah. you know complete management of mm. of everything for, for Jurgen Klopp. I think there is within his coaching team, within the scouts, the transfers, the relationship that he has with the owners. I think there's obviously inevitably he's got more power and more say than what he has 
you know, when he came in. Yeah. Um, that is inevitable that, that it's going to happen. But I don't get the impression that if, if Jurgen Klopp left today that Liverpool couldn't go and get somebody else. And obviously mm. there'd be a transition period, there'd be changes, there'd be things that you'd have to get used to. But I, I, get, the, I get the impression that the, the structure and the way that it's set up, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be perfect. Obviously, you'd rather not lose him. I want him to stay at Liverpool for mm. as long as he possibly can. But I don't think it would be, you know, a Wenger or, or a Ferguson situation. I, I just think Liverpool are a little bit more sensible in terms of, of the way that they've kind of set themselves up for that one day being a possibility. Yeah, and that sort of comes full circle. Really, is what we were saying at the start in terms of having that long-term structure that can kind of persist even when the individuals on the pitch and off the pitch change really. But yeah, we'll, we'll leave it there for this episode. Um, thanks very much everyone for listening. Remember to check out all the written content that goes up on Liverpool.com between now and the Merseyside derby at the weekend. And also obviously there'll be plenty on the Blood Red channel too. You can also listen back to last week's podcast where we took a deep dive into Alexis McAllister's start at Anfield. But for our next episode, we'll be back next week when the Premier League will obviously have returned. So we will see you then.